This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being. Being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. Valeria Tellez interviews Maria Romano, the author of Just One to a Plus One, an inspiring guide on how to start dating again and let go of the past. Maria Romano is the founder of True Love Knots, LLC, based in fabulously exciting Las Vegas. She started a small rental car company with her husband, Frank. Maria's company, grew to over $18 million in annual sales, while Frank expanded into a gaming company. Life changed forever when her father and brother, Frank's business partners, had their programmer develop a rigged video poker program and then murdered the programmer. The gaming control board closed Frank's company, even though he was innocent, and the scandal caused Frank to experience a massive heart attack. A heart transplant gave Frank and Maria 15 more years of life and love together until Frank's passing in 2012. Maria started picking up the pieces of her life and reinvented herself. She saw how the world caters to the young while the message of ageism causes so many not to realize their best days are ahead. Maria started to date again and found that there were many people just like her that had no clue where to start and what to do. Maria then created a program going from just one to plus one. Her drive to help people find love also inspired her to write this book. When she's not busy connecting with her audiences, Maria is a licensed minister and has been for 10 years. She has performed over 3,000 wedding ceremonies. When she is not performing ceremonies or coaching, Maria loves being home, spending time with her pet, cooking, and making memories with her family and friends. She also enjoys wine tasting, exercising, reading, and volunteering as a pastoral care minister, and mediating in small claims for local residents. Maria's greatest joy is her children and grandchildren. Meet Maria on truelovenots.com. Here is the interview with Maria Romano. In your own words, who is Maria Romano? Oh, Maria Romano is a mother, a grandma, a friend. I'm also a minister, and I'm a person that really enjoys being around people. And I love being around love, Valerie. That's definitely, I want to say, that's who I am. Yeah, how beautiful. And with that in mind, as we spoke off record too, love, that is such a big and beautiful, powerful word that a lot of times we misunderstand or we define differently. So my first question to you, or the second official question is, what is true love? Well, you know, true love you can define in a couple of different ways. I think true love first starts with uh, yourself, being authentic to who you are in order to really go out and be able to receive love and, and give love. True love starts with your inner self, Valerie. That's one of the first things and one of the things I like to touch on. And, and actually accepting yourself for all your perfections and imperfections and loving who you are. So that's part of what, what I would define as true love. I absolutely have to use the same word, love that idea. <laughs> I usually ask the question, do you believe in unconditional self-love? And most people do. 
but most people think that is an unrealistic goal to love ourselves unconditionally. What would you say to that? Well, you know, I, I think that there are times that we、um, self sabotage ourselves and we don't. I don't know if we don't love ourselves. Maybe we probably use the word like, but but、um, I think it's important. And as as we go through life, definitely we you learn how to love yourself unconditionally and recognize that you're not always going to do things as you think they are perfectly, and that you're going to、uh, you know have some challenges, and that's okay because that's how you're going to get to love yourself more and get to know yourself. When you go through challenges, and sometimes you have bloopers with those challenges, that's okay. Those are life learning lessons, right? There's something that you said that caught my attention. Love does not only happen by chance. Talk to me about that phrase. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's true. Love doesn't happen by chance. Most of us, we are conditioned to believe that love is found through. Fairy tales, right? Because of the way we're programmed, we're programmed through romance novels, television, movies, literature that tell us true love is a product of chance. So you might expect Prince or Princess Charming to show up on your doorstep, but that's not necessarily really reality. Reality is is you need to take. Your life in your hands and develop a roadmap to finding love, knowing what you want, knowing who you are, and when you open yourself to that, you're not leaving it up to chance. You're making a choice. And you also mentioned that finding true love and choosing, yeah, they are connected. And we'll explore that a little bit more. Also, being authentic, which has a lot to do with self knowledge. Another thing you mentioned that I thought was really, I mean, true and real. There is no perfect relationship. Yeah, that's true,、uh, Valerie. There isn't any perfect relationship. I was married for 33 years before my husband passed away in 2012. And of course, you know, when I got married to him, oh my gosh, you know, I had, I was 23 years old. I became a stepmom, then a parent. And then I found out when life threw us some curveballs. I always thought that,、um, you know, Frank was going to be my Prince Charming, and he was going to solve everything. Well, you know, that's not necessarily the case. And that's when you also you you realize, gosh, you know what? My mate's a little imperfect, right?、Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! But but it is true. And then what happens is, when you see that there's a blemish. What happens? Sometimes you can either pull away, or you learn to lean into it and understand that we all have imperfections about ourselves. We all, you know, so to love somebody, you know, unconditionally is is tough sometimes too. But you, but that's okay because what happens in relationships when you're going through times that are difficult, and you work your way through them and communicate, it really strengthens strengthens the relationship. Another question I would love to ask you is about life in general. What do you think or feel is the purpose of the human experience? You know, I, I think the purpose of the human experience is being able to feel emotions, feel love, for example. And sometimes you might feel perplexed, you might feel anger, you might feel fear. But I think the purpose is to be able to identify. Those different emotions, those feelings, and to be able to、um, look at them from an objective viewpoint, and, and then if you're able to manage that in a way that it's productive, then you're able to manage your feelings in a good way and feel and allow yourself to feel. But one thing is, when I think of feelings, I think of being vulnerable too. I think that's、uh, something very authentic. And that、uh, is a big, you know, something that's really big. And as a matter of fact, I talk to people about that because women have a tendency of being vulnerable, but men don't. And that's a feeling and an emotion as well.、And、we need to learn how to really lean into it and not and embrace it in a lot of ways. So I think the purpose is being able to understand your feelings and allow yourself to feel them, even if they're not. 
always the best feelings where you get that pit in your stomach and you're just not, I don't know if it's fear sometimes or just uneasiness. And sometimes you have to go through that in order to understand that. I'm wondering why for men, it's more challenging to be vulnerable. Well, I think that's, that's because of, again, going back to men are heroes, right? Mm -hmm. They're rushing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Thank the day teachings and yeah that's why, you know what my generation <laughs> i have yeah. to say because i'm a baby boomer is that we really were programmed in that respect and now with gen xers and millennials and younger we're getting to understand that you know what men are just as vulnerable as we are and they're said i think the younger generation they are leaning into their feelings and allowing them to be displayed which is good it's healthy what do you love most about being a woman? Gosh, I don't know. I have to, if I had to sit back, that's an interesting question. Well, first of all, I love the feminine side. That is one thing I definitely do enjoy. And I, I want to say my, my mother instincts also uh, that I do enjoy as well. But on the other side, I think being a woman, I, I feel that we, and all women, we're able to multitask more than men. So, <laughs> that's what we yeah. do it. <laughs> and, and that's what but I enjoy, you know, I, I've never, um, even though I, I was in the rental car business for many years before I transi transitioned into this field, and I was in a male-dominated industry, but I always maintained my feminism in a, a professional way because you can go from one extreme to the other. And sometimes you do, you lose yourself in that respect. And we've heard, you know, where some women are very aggressive maybe with their, and I've learned how to be able to be firm, but still be who I am, which I am a woman. I'd like to understand that more, Maria. What would that be like still being yourself as a woman, feminine in a professional way? What would that look like? Well, really what it looks like is it really starts with your whole persona and your energy and what you're emulating. And um, I think for women, it's important to be able to maintain a professional demeanor about them, first of all. But, but at the same token, you know, let's, let's face it, we're a little softer where that you've heard the expression, we shouldn't cry in the workplace. Well, I don't think that's necessarily true. Not that you're going to full blown out, you know, uh, start having, you know, overflow of water. But I think for me, it just, it looks, um, it looks like somebody that's poised and in control and confident. That's what I have to say that looks like to me. And my follow up questions about the challenges. Have you faced any challenges for being a woman? Oh, gosh, yes. You know, it's interesting. When I started in the rent-a-car business in the, the 70s, uh, I was president of our rental car company. And I had many times where somebody would be unhappy with something or they'd call me about a service and they would say, well, I want to speak to whomever is in charge. Who is he? Right, I'm like, okay. Right. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes. That, and then when I uh, moved into becoming a minister... You know, I perform wedding ceremonies in Las Vegas, and there are still people, and that's okay, couples that prefer to have a male marry them. So I still do, at times, experience that as well. But uh, it, it's okay. It's it, it's all good because the world is changing, and I think men can do anything and everything uh, on the same level, personally. Do you have a vision for a new reality, a better reality? Well, you know, I think, Valerie, when we come to, when you've lived as long as I have, we always have a vision of what we think the reality, ideal reality is. But I've also come to understand, especially with 2020, is I don't have any expectation level at this point in time. My only expectation level is that we get this particular virus under control so that we can get to some sort of whatever our new normal is going to be. But I have learned um, to be flexible. That I will tell you, because we don't know if we're going to have some setbacks with it. But um, I do feel very positive, and I, I think with anything like what we've been faced with, there's going to be some good change coming about. 
even though some of us might not be aware of what it currently is. What is the meaning of freedom to you? What is to be free? Gosh, you know, freedom is so many things, I think, to so many people. First, starting with living in the United States, uh, I feel that we, we have a freedom to voice who we are. We, we have a freedom if we want the rights to bear arms. You know, those are things that are important to many people. But for myself, I think freedom is not being tied down to something, not um, being in a situation where I can't control it or a situation that's not healthy. So for me, freedom means being as having as little dysfunction <laughs> in my life as possible. And you yeah. know, that, that takes time to really get to that level. But uh, that's what freedom means to me. So um, how did you become a writer? Oh, gosh, I didn't even, <laughs> I never fathomed myself to write. But I do have some really good coaches. And I recognized oh, last year that um, a lot of people had some very bad experiences about getting back in the dating world. And you heard all these horror stories and, pe and because people were fearful, they were listening to other individuals as well. And I wanted to write the book to talk about how you can get back in the dating world, especially Valerie, when you've been in a relationship and maybe you're divorced, maybe you're widowed or widower. So with that said, I, um, I started writing about a bit of my experiences and what I and outlining what I felt that I could share with other individuals that were in my my uh, age category. And then when the pandemic hit, that's when one of my coaches said, well, this is the time that you can get ready and start writing a book. And that's when I really, you know, I figured this is the time. This was God giving me this this time to write the book. I don't know if I would have finished it already at this point in time. So I'm, I'm really glad that I had this opportunity. And I'm hoping that this is the first of many. Your book is titled Just One to a Plus One, an inspiring guide on how to start dating again and let go of the past. And what a powerful message for all of us, letting go of the past. Is that um, something that happens as a process or could be actually an understanding, a moment of understanding? Well, you know, that is a process and it was a process that I recognized for myself when I started getting back in the dating world, when I started, uh, when I dated other people and then also as I took on clients. And what has to happen be really before you can move forward is as much as you can, you need to to shed those negative uh, transitions from your last relationship. And what I mean by that, we have residuals, Valerie, from our last relationships. And I, I, I have this um, area in my book called dysfunctional detoxing. Right, where I take and I talk about the process of you know, what attracted you in your last relationship to your partner? So, for example, you might admire that your partner loves spending time with his or her family. But those are things that you might admire that you uh, really admire your partner because they were so dedicated to their profession or to their children. Then the next process is, is what did you dislike you know, after the relationship evolved. So your likes that you really appreciated and admired with your partner could have then progressed to where you're resentful that they spend a lot of time with their family. You're resentful they spend time with their children. You're resentful that they spend a lot of time in their profession. So it's important to understand what happened and why in that respect what you thought you admired really turned into something that you loathed. And then the other component is moving from that to uh, what can I have done differently? You know, what can I have done differently? And if I knew what I knew now, and that's tough sometimes. And then the last component is, is what 
part did I have in the demise or the destruction of the relationship? So that's the quadrant that I use, and I and I use that I use that for myself as well. And when you really take a moment and, and think about that, when it comes to your relationships, and you're able to dig deep, so that when you get back in the dating world, you don't necessarily have these past residuals hanging on to you. And could, for example, you could have had a, a partner that you know there was infidelity, and you don't want to walk into the next relationship with something that triggers you that's really unfair to the new partner. And I also, uh, when I work with clients that really harbor a lot of strong emotions, I recommend they go for, you know, find good a good therapist, a good psychiatrist, because that's important as well, to be able to heal and to forgive and recognize that just because the last relationship didn't work and forgive yourself and forgive your partner, that doesn't mean that you can't find a healthy love. How do we know when we are there healed from our past? Well, when you can actually recognize certain triggers. So, for example, if um, in your past relationship, somebody, let's take, for example, let's talk somebody was unfaithful and they um, called you and they said, I'm not going to be home in time for dinner, blah, blah, blah. And it turned out to be something else. That was one trigger. But when you move to the next relationship and you really give somebody the opportunity, if they call and say, listen, I can't make it, something came up and, ex you know, really take it at face value and don't dig any deeper into it. When you're able to step back and, and look at it that way. And also, I think it, it also well, it boils down to the fact that you need to make the right choice when you start a relationship, Valerie. So if there are red flags in the beginning and you don't listen to those red flags and go with your gut, that is going to turn around and bite you. OK, that's going to come about. Right. But if you really if you take the time to vet somebody and get to know somebody and really and, and understand them. And then that's going to make a difference where you're not going to have you're not going to have to take those past emotions and they're not going to, you know, spill over into your new relationship. I do have a question. Oh, yeah. You mentioned red flags. So what are some of them that we should be aware of? Well, you know, red flags are certain people have uh, different uh, deal breakers. So, for example, if somebody drinks a lot, you know, yeah, that's a big one. <laughs> that's a big one. Also, if somebody is uh, the type of person that they embellish their background, they embellish um, what they have. And there are people out there that do that. Uh, those are red flags. But there are red flags that can occur before you meet somebody because, as you know, dating apps are, are huge nowadays. That's especially now with the pandemic. If you meet somebody online and they never want to move it to a phone call, they only want to keep it to texting, that in itself, or somebody's really, uh, they're limited. So there could be, there's a lot of people, believe it or not, with what's going on in the world, there's a percentage of married people that are on these dating apps as well and they're just looking for a thrill so red flags you need to keep in mind and then of course if anybody ever gives you a sob story and needs you to help them out that is a red flag please don't give anyone money please right people asking for money that's a, a huge flag it does happen why did you choose to become a minister when we sold our rental car company in 2010, Frank didn't pass away till 12. And Frank, my husband, Frank, so that you know, he had a heart transplant in 1997. And he managed to live 15 years right, as a, with the, somebody else's heart in him. So we always knew we were on borrowed time. And I knew that I wanted to do something that was fulfilling. And, but I did want something that was going to keep me busy because I knew eventually, you know, again, I knew he was going to pass away. It just, it's just the, I hate to say it, it's just what it is when you are transplant, especially with hearts. So we were so fortunate to have 15 years. And I went to a wedding ceremony of a friend in 2009 
here in Las Vegas, and there was a woman that was performing a service. And I said, you know what? What a fabulous profession. Something that you're walking in, Valerie, and you people are in love. And when you leave, oh, my gosh, they're on steroids in love. <laughs> True. And that's when I said, I can do that. So what I did was I started doing some research because in Las Vegas, you have to go through licensing. You have to get yourself aligned with some sort of religious organization. And I did those two things. And then you have to get out there and promote yourself. And that's really, I have to tell you, that was a very male-dominated industry at that time. And also, we were not performing. Uh, there was a lot of ministers that were not performing same-sex same commitment ceremonies because the same-sex marriages were not legal at that time. So what I did is, is I put together a, um, a CD, like a video, we and I did a mock wedding in my backyard. And then I took that CD and I put together, you know, a little a resume about myself. And I went to every chapel up and down the strip. And that's how I started. And yes, and that was over 11 years ago. There was something that you mentioned in your book that caught my attention. It's beautifully said in written. I think I'm paraphrasing here, but you said that most of us place a lot of emphasis in the way we look. So you say, you are not your size, you're not your age, you're not your financial report, you are a beautiful creation. I love that. Thank you. And, and that is really, it, it takes time to come to that place in life where we accept who we are. Listen, we're all, we're all not blessed to look like, like Jennifer Lopez, for example, or Beyonce, or... <laughs> Sophia Loren, but we're all blessed that we have beautiful qualities about ourselves. And those qualities, once they come out and erupt, that's what becomes beautiful. And, and what I method I use and when I go out and speak is I tell people to just close their eyes and think about somebody that you love. You know, whether it's a romantic love, whether it's a child, a mom, a dad, right? And when you when you picture that person, you love them not because of what who they look like, what they, but you love them for who they are, and that's the beauty. And and we do place an emphasis so much on the physical, and it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be uh, be aware of your physical. Because I always tell clients, especially women, because they're always looking to go out and they want more Botox, you know, more fillers, <laughs> facelift. Nothing looks as good as healthy. And, and really, that's what the most important thing is. And when you are putting good food in your body and watching what you do and, and doing just a bit of exercise, and, and again, everybody's different shapes and sizes, then when you do that, when you're healthy and you have that glow, that attracts many, many people. They are going to just gravitate towards you because you're healthy, you're happy, and you really love who you are on the inside. This is not part of the conversation, really, but in a way it is. Grief, what is your best advice for those who have lost recently their husbands or their partners? Yeah, well, you know, people uh, grieve in, in many different ways. And one thing is, is we are in a society today where we're told that we should move on. Um, maybe it's for the best. And, and that's not necessarily necessarily true. It is important that when you lose somebody, that you are going to go through that loss. And they're going to have a grieving process. And you need to go through that grieving process. Because that is going to allow your heart to heal. And you shouldn't cast aside. Sometimes, again, you have to lean into those feelings as painful, as painful as they are when you go through a loss. But also at the same token, and especially when you're speaking about maybe women in general, because we might be so dependent upon our partner, is um, it's going to take time for you. You're going to have to recognize that you are now the person. Maybe you're the person in the family that is like the head of the household or the, the only one in the household. So you're going to have a responsibility to yourself first. But allow yourself to grieve. Allow yourself to memorialize the person that was in your life. But also now 
this is a new chapter in your life and it's going to take time. It's nobody said it's going to be easy, but as you go through it, the pain will lessen and all you'll do is start just remembering in time the uh, great times you might have had with your spouse in the past or partner, and but also being able to move on and have a fulfilling, rewarding life without your partner. Maybe then you'll go find a plus one again. It just depends upon where you're at in life and what you're looking for. I love in your book also that you have the uh, love myself list suggestion, improve myself list. And then you have also the seven days of loving yourself self-compassion, compliment yourself, self-forgiveness, focus on your health, feed your mind, feed your spirit, and rest and relax. Talk to me about day six, feed your spirit. Mm, yeah. You know, it's, it's feeding your spirit can be a couple of different things. For me, it's praying. For me, it's, it's meditating. And it, it, there's a time that we are so busy, so busy with doing th things and moving from one thing to another to another process. And I think feeding a spirit is actually stopping and just enjoying the moment so that you can revitalize and recharge yourself and get to and just enjoy the simple, simple things. Maybe it's just sitting in your backyard and watching the hummingbirds or, or the bees or your dog, or just in, even if, or if you're fortunate, maybe you live, like I see a picture of you you're near the water. Right? Oh, oh yes. But Boy, that's how you that. feed. You need to feed your spirit because when you fill your cup, it's going, you're, you're then able to go out into the world once you feed it again so that you are able to be the best version of who you are, but also give of yourself in the best way possible. Yeah, online dating <laughs> and rejection. That's actually rejection. That's something that for most of us is a traumatic experience. So talk to me about how do we learn to deal with rejection in a more graceful way? Well, you know, it's important that to understand that uh, you're going to have rejection. People are going to what they call ghost you. Are, are you familiar with that term? No, no. Ghosting? Okay. No. So you can go out with somebody and think that they're great and you might go out a couple of times and they text you and all of a sudden they disappear. Mm. Oh. No call, no show, no texting, nothing. And all of a sudden, and that is a form of rejection or what what is important is and i also tell clients if there is somebody you go out with and you don't feel that the perfect fit and you you can just send them a text and tell them i think you're a fabulous person you have a lot of great qualities you're just not a match for me so that's a healthy form of rejection but then you have that ghosting form of rejection uh, or somebody just flats out tells you you look nothing like your pictures okay and that also can be devastating it crushes your ego so it's important that you, whenever you walk into a situation like that, you need to take your love tribe, okay? And your love tribe, people that you surround yourself with that have been in your life, they might be currently, presently living, or they could be gone, they're spirits. And you keep them around you, people that have motivated you, people that were your biggest cheerleaders and supporters. So that when you get back into the dating world, and then you come home and you're feeling like, oh, my gosh, you know, I, my my confidence is shattered. And again, go back and pull. But what would so and so say to me if they were around? What would so and so tell me to do and pull from that? And when you do, you're able to bounce back. And one thing I tell clients also is start Googling the best commencement speeches because commencement speeches are great motivation motivators. And they also talk about when you have been down and out and challenging, right? And you're at rock bottom. And when you're going through that confidence where it's shattered, you're at rock bottom. And that's a platform to grow. And those are the things that I recommend when you're going through that. You mentioned writing the online profile. That's really important. And you help your clients to do that. Talk to me about the importance of writing a good online profile. Yeah. 
Well, a good online profile, first of all, says a lot about the individual. And I, you know, I always tell somebody to start off on a positive note saying that I, you can write, I'm energetic, I'm athletic, I love going out, and I love exploring new places, new adventure. I do enjoy being spontaneous and travel, uh, as well as, you know, maybe cooking at home, spending time with families, families and spending time with the loved one. Uh, there are people that write on a profile that starts off with, I don't want any drama in my life. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one, too. <laughs> That's Very saying, good. Well, yes, but I've had drama and I'm attracting drama. Right. Uh, I don't want anyone that has addictions. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, so the online profile is a resume. It's a resume <laughs> Highlighting who you are. Yeah. And that's what I, I tell people. Highlight, take your best qualities and highlight. Are you adventurous? Are you the type of baby you just like staying at home and reading a book and spending time with your loved one by the fire? That's okay, too. But be honest with who you are. And I think that's the key thing. Don't try to be who you're not. I have a few more questions for you, Maria. But before I ask them, would you like to add anything or read a passage in your book? Well, you know, I, I think it's important to remember that no matter what age you are, right, no, no matter where you come from, that you can find love again, Valerie. And don't ever think that you're not worthy or you don't deserve love because everybody deserves love. What is to be successful to you? What is success? You know, success is defined in many different right ways. Most people think successful is making a lot of money. And really what success is, is being able to foster and create great relationships. So whether you're creating great relationships with people that you're coaching, your clients, that and that you fall in love with them and they in return fall in love with you, that to me determines success. And when you, when you get to that point, what happens is, you when you have these great relationships you also have peace of mind and then from there the bottom line is is then you will also profit as well but profit emotionally spiritually mentally and physically what was the hardest lesson to learn about yourself in life as of today forgiveness if you knew you would die anytime soon, meaning losing the body, would you make any change in your life or do anything in a different way? No, I wouldn't, Valerie, because then I wouldn't have experienced everything I've had. What are three things about life you know for sure as of now? Well, for sure, I know it's important that you do have a self-acceptance of who you are and accept others mm. for who they are with no expectation levels. Those are the three things. Thank you so much again for your genuine presence, your wisdom, your message, mission. I do have one more question, but this is a technical one. Where can we find more information about you, your books, products, services, and future projects? <laughs> well, you can find me, Maria at truelovenots.com, and the knots is spelled K-N-O-T-S. Uh, and my website is truelovenots.com. Also, my book, Going From Just One to a Plus One, is on Amazon in paperback and ebook, and the Spanish version was just loaded up today. And also, at the end of my book, on the ebook and the paperback, is my personal email, so I am always accessible. Wonderful. Thank you so much again, Maria, and we'll talk soon. Thank you. Bye for now. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Maria Romano and her work, please visit truelovenots.com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening, and bye for now. <laughs>